The First World War was brutal in every sense. Those who were able to walk away still carried the trauma and shell shock with them. Our founder, Douglas Cook, who was able to return home, became driven to create something beautiful that was influenced by his time spent convalescing in stately homes of the English countryside. He quoted, I have given to create something beautiful, someplace restful in a world full of trouble and full of hates and greed. His heritage has certainly done that. He has created a collection of trees from every continent in the world. And it is estimated that at one point he imported over 7,000 different species. Why? Well, at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, his foreboding of nuclear annihilation led him to collect as many differing species in knowledge that our isolated position could protect species and then repatriate them should a cataclysmic event have occurred. How and why is that relevant today? Well, as the most impactful species on the planet, we humans are influencing our planet. Some would say at an alarming rate, and others would use some of Cook's terminology, such as foreboding, annihilation, and cataclysmic. Highlighting these issues, acting as advocates, and prescribing solutions, many of the world's conservation organizations are active to ensure that irreputable evidence guides and influences our general populace and those we collectively choose as decision makers. The Botanic Gardens Conservation International, the BGCI, is one such organization. Their mission is to mobilize botanic gardens and engage partners in securing plant diversity for the well-being of people. Established in 1987, today they represent botanic gardens in more than 100 countries, connecting these gardens and people as a global network for plant conservation. At the beginning of September 2021, the BGCI released the State of the World's Tree Report. We are privileged to be joined today by Paul Smith, the Secretary General of the BGCI, to discuss this report and get a greater understanding of the BGCI, the importance of collection like ours, and how collectively we can make an impact for global tree conservation. Paul is a plant ecologist with practical experience in seed conservation, afforestation, habitat restoration, botanical survey and inventory, environmental impact assessment, park management, systems and ecotourism, and has over 30 years experience of working in Africa. Kia ora, Paul, thank you for your time. Welcome. Uh, to start off, is there anything else you'd like to add about BGCI and its aims, goals, and then introduce some of the key findings uh, from the State of the Trees report for us? BGCI's mission is very straightforward. It's, um, it's to mobilise um, botanical expertise for people, plants and, and the planet. Uh, we, of course, sit at the centre of um, well, the world's largest um, plant conservation network and botanical network. Uh, I think uh, the word bot botanic gardens in our title um, can be misleading because we have many members from many different sectors. The common denominator is botanical diversity. So many arboreta, many forestry institutes, um, universities, um, as well as botanic gardens. And primarily we're interested in um, the loss of biodiversity, adaptation to climate change, um, you know, really actually the, the three uh, major challenges, climate change, loss of biodiversity and poverty, um, and the ways that plants um, can help to address those problems and particularly the skills um, knowledge, the collections, the data that we have within the botanical community. Yeah, so um, so referencing the, um, the State of the World's Trees report then, I mean, that must have been a, a long process. Can you talk a little bit about how, how that started and, and obviously sure. it would be great. Yes, it has been a long process and um, you know, the first, the first issue which uh, was that we didn't have a, a global list of trees or at least not one that was Sort of had been sort of taxonomically verified and um you know where there was some some agreement to a certain extent that's reflective of um plant taxonomy and the fact that we are now i think approaching more or less a stable plant taxonomy for the world's 400,000 plant species we've got world flora online we've got various other tools um and checklists world checklist as well um so I think it was 20, 2017, we published the first uh, global checklist of tree species, geo-reference to country, and for some larger countries to at the provincial level. Um, and that really was, um, if you like, the register that, that we used to then look at the proportion of trees that had had any kind of a, a conservation assessment. Um, and in the same year, we launched Threat Search, which is um, the most comprehensive database of threat assessments for plants. 
um, because one of the problems with the standard, the industry standard, which is the, the IUCN global red list, is that plants are hugely underrepresented on it. Um, and back then, I think we were looking at about six or seven percent of plant diversity on the red list because um, so few had been assessed. So threat search um, also takes into account non-IUCN assessments. It takes into account non-global assessments. And when you're dealing with endemics, essentially a national assessment is a global assessment. Um, so we had a baseline uh, and we were then able to go out and get funding from the Frank Linear Foundation, in fact, um, to carry out the global tree assessment. And the idea with that was to assess all 60,000 of the world's tree species um, by 2023, we, we, will, we will do that. And we've steadily through working obviously through um, regional specialist groups, um, Plant Conservation Committee of IUCN um, uh, and, and others, uh, we've been adding around 10,000 tree species to the global red list each year. Um, sometimes taxonomically, uh, sometimes um, you know, working in taxonomic groups. So eucalyptus, for example, was a, was a, um, you know, a big undertaking. Um, and sometimes geographically, more often geographically. Um, and the idea is to, um, to get all of those assessed on the global IUCN red list, which is the highest profile um, sort of threat assessments by 2023. Um, so um, the State of the World's Trees report was, it preempts that to a degree because when you add up everything on threat search and everything that's now on the global red list, we actually have conservation assessments for about 92% um, of, of tree species. So, and that was already giving us um, a lot of information. Uh, so, you know, we know from those data that uh, 17 and a half thousand tree species fall into the threat category, um, whether they're vulnerable, critically endangered or endangered or extinct in the wild. <clears throat> and then there are 440 odd that are critically endangered against the D criterion. So there are fewer than 50 individuals left in the wild for those species. We also had a lot of data uh, on um, status of protection, whether they're in ex situ collections, um, whether they're protected um, in situ, uh, in protected areas or not. Because along with carrying out the assessments comes the data that goes with that, including um, distribution maps. Um, so we have, we have cleaned up um, GBIF data for 48,000 of those tree species. Wow. Uh, and that's, that's a, a fantastic tool when it comes to understanding where these grow, what kind of conditions they need, um, and also their, their status, frankly. So, um, you know, that's, you know, the, the, the exciting stuff is still to come in a sense in, in, in using much of that data for species recovery, um, and you know what I'm equally excited about with the State of the World's Trees report, we, we at the same time launched the portal, yep. um, and the tree, the global tree portal, um, is a useful tool for practitioners and policymakers. So if you if you go to the country level and you just put in New Zealand, um, or any country you fancy, mm -hmm. and it will tell you what the scorecard is. You know how many how many of those are in ex situ collections, how many are are protected in situ, and more importantly, which ones are not. Um, and you can download the checklists, you can download lists of endemics, you can download lists of um, threatened species for each country in the world. Um, at the species level, um, and we still got a lot of work to do here, and we're going to start with the critically endangered. We want to track in real time species recovery efforts. You know, the, the fundamental problem with the red list um, or any list of threatened species is that it's a snapshot in time. It's not telling you exactly what's going on now. Yeah. And, you know, as an example, uh, we set up a program in Mauritius a few years back. We went expecting to find 54 critically endangered tree species against the D criterion. I mean, Mauritius is a real hotspot for, as most tropical islands are. Mm -hmm. We found actually that there were probably 15 that needed attention because the rest had been in recovery programs since the Red List was published in 1999. They've made significant progress in 20 years. Yeah. Um, and we need to know that, you know, um, so so what the, the species tracker will do is track in real time who is working on which species and most importantly, which species nobody is working on so that we can say, um, you know, we can say to you guys, we can say, look, um, you know, you've got X number of species in, in New Zealand that nobody seems to be working their recovery. They're not in ex situ collections. What about it? Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, that's the power of our 
network, um, it's the follow-up. It's, it's, it's not just providing the data. It's, it's how we deploy that expertise. Um, you know, to, um, to to do something about this, which we, we have the skills for. Yeah, exactly. and that's really great to see because one of the things that I find with the IUCN Red List is that it highlights the cute and the cuddly or the, the dean to be cute and cuddly, but that cute and cuddly needs to live somewhere and nine times out of 10, that's probably in some type of tree. So it's great that we've got these resources now because um, it just, and these reports that we can just go, hey, that stuff needs to live somewhere and nine times out of 10, it's up a tree or near to a tree or uh, has some type of uh, ecosystem service that it's attached to that's gonna provide us with a huge benefit because um, you know, it's, it's gonna be of, of, of huge value to us if, uh, if they disappear. And um, that's such a great resource now to have. And um, we were, uh, I was um, heavily inspired by the Widringtonia YTI, the Melange Cedar. Um, we've got a couple here at our Arboretum, you know, this is a, a great example of where a tree was in the less than fifties, as you said, uh, as a criteria in, in Malawi. And the work that Bedgebury Pine Eatum, I believe, were doing with repatriating their seed out there is, has had a huge impact, a great conservation um, goal with local people being involved with growing those plants on and planting them back out. And uh, I think the numbers are about right, about 500,000 new saplings have gone back into the environment. That's right. And that's just yep. exactly how we as a ex situ location with trees can have that impact. And when we look through our collection here, we've got things like Olnus henrii, um, which is extinct in the wild in Taiwan. Uh, and if, according to the records, there's only three places in the world where it exists. And yet we've got, we've in the, since um, we've started a focus on it, we've got probably about 15 or 16 new saplings coming on because we've focused on it. We can start to look, maybe how, even start to have those conversations with, um, with Taiwan, who knows? I know that they've went through a huge expansion with, their, with Taipei. And that was allegedly the reason why the majority of the species was lost. But these are the type of impacts and um, that Cook, our founder, who was really hell bent on collecting as many species as possible with that foreboding of, of nuclear war, he thought that he would be able to send some back. I mean, our isolated position here is just so key for that. And uh, yeah. it's weird that the narrative has changed. I sincerely hope that nuclear war, of course, never happens, and I don't think it will. But um, our climate and our impact on this planet is so great that it just it just comes full circle with his original uh, ambition. So. Um, so that kind of leads me on to the next question, which is quite nice, really. So I'd like to get your opinion on, on how important the distribution of species throughout ex situ collection is for the BGC. I know it's probably a loaded question, but, um, you know, because it's, uh, it's kind of your bread and butter, but um, the distribution and, and, of course, maybe even the density of those numbers or the density of species, the variety of species within each of these ex situ collections, um, how important is it for, um, for, as you said, for being proactive in the future? Yeah, it's absolutely essential. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons why. Um, you know, we, you, you know, obviously, um, one thing that we discourage through our accreditation program is um, gardens holding, um, you know, the only one. Um, and there are a number of cases where that's the case. I mean, material should always be duplicated because stuff happens. Um, and we've had a number of cases of the sort of last known one in cultivation. Um, sort of being killed by a, a over enthusiastic horticulture. So, um, you know, that's fundamental is duplication. Um, you know, we're also learning a lot about uh, climate uh, and um, adaptation. Uh, there's all of that, which is a fundamental role for, for Arborita. That's another good reason. Yeah. Um, space, um, you know, keeping genetically comprehensive or as diverse collections as possible. And actually, the, the Melange Cedar is a good case in point there because. Um, you know, you may not know that we we are afforesting or reforesting that mountain using a very narrow genetic base because um, there are ex situ collections being used. So there's a there are three um, reasonably large um, ex situ collections in in the region, or they're they're, they're essentially um, managed forests. Um, a couple in Malawi and then one in Tanzania. So we genetically tested them to see whether they had come with different provenances from different parts of the mountain. No, they came, all came from exactly the same place, which was outside the forester's hut um, <laughs> on the, uh, don't, don't you love those, those old British foresters? They, they just, they were having their tea and the, there was a tree nearby. So they probably came from the same group of trees. So we have a narrow genetic base. Um, and yet, uh, fortunately, the Millennium Seed Bank um, collected from across the mountain 
20 years ago. So we, we have some more diverse material there. We're interested in your collections in New Zealand because um, there is a, um, a Malawi New Zealand connection with Jim Chapman, who was um, was a, a British forester on that mountain in, in Mulanji. And we know he collected material and some of that is in New Zealand. It's quite likely that that material will be genetically different um, and um, should, you know, something we need to factor in, bring that back on, on the mountain. Yeah. So those are all good reasons for having, <clears throat> you know, genetically diverse dispersed collections. Just one other thing to add to that, you know, we are a long way behind the zoo community, for example, in um, exchanging material on a kind of pedigree basis for, for breeding purposes, for, for, for conservation purposes. But we will be launching in the next six months a new um, module on plant search, uh, which is taken directly from Species 360, from from the um, the zoo community, which is is designed specifically for exchanging um, genotypes and um, genetically diverse material for recovery, restoration, and recovery um, programs for for species. So that's going to make a big difference, I think, um, to the way that we exchange material, um, and we do that in a, uh, you know, in a much more rational way than we have been uh, hitherto. Yeah, that's good. It's good to hear. Um, uh, but yeah, that, that link to uh, to, Mal to Malawi is interesting. We'll certainly uh, chase up Jim. <laughs> so I mean, I, I, we I assume that Cook would have got his um, his source of the of the Wittrigtonia from from the UK because that's where a lot of his stuff came from through via Hilliers. So um, it'll be interesting to maybe do that genetic track um, uh, and see if there is any difference. Our, we've got one um, specimen, which is probably around about 30 meters tall, 25, 30 meters tall. So it's a well mature tree and it's got heaps of seed on it. And we've got about five or six other ones, which are, which are small. So maybe we could, maybe we should, uh, it should be a, a little test for us. If there's somebody who can take the seed and do some genetic diversity uh, testing on it for us, we'll, we'll send some in the post. We can do that. Um, so the US Forest Service have been helping with that that work um but yeah it'd be worth thinking so hazel chapman as far as i know is still in new zealand she may be okay. sure she'll watch this and get in touch um jim's jim's daughter okay. um yeah he passed away some years years back but um yeah i'd be interested to know where that material came from because it yeah, could it be as good. i say genetically important yeah yeah so um on to the next sort of uh, link then if you will so in in your opinion where does the balance between seed banking and uh uh, and uh, collections with the living ex situ collections sit with you. I mean, how does how do you feel that we are set with um, with with seed banking uh, trees? Obviously, not all tree seeds freeze, so uh, such living ex situ living collections for those species are, are critical. But in general, um, where are you where are you at with the uh, with the seed banking versus living collection scenario? Well, I mean, just from the economic perspective, if you're dealing with orthodox seeds, it's a it's a lot cheaper to um, you know to to store. Um, seed than it is to maintain living collections. Um, there's, there's no question about that. We, I mean, the figures that we sort of developed from uh, from the Millennium Seed Bank, which admittedly was done at scale, was something like three thousand US dollars a species, and that was for an average size of thirty thousand seeds. Now that that mean or average um, takes into account orchids, um, so you get a million seeds and about you know that that, that much, but um, and it's more difficult to get that those kind of numbers for trees, particularly for threatened trees. But it is very cost effective. It costs almost nothing to to um, to freeze them. Um, so we were running that uh, on compressors that were coming off um, photovoltaic panels. Um, you know, it's it's a very efficient way of storing seed. Anyone who works in horticulture will know, though, that there is a big difference between seed and a living plant and there's actually a big difference between germinating a seed and actually establishing a living plant um, so i think where uh, living collections come in and so so the millennium seed bank for example um, provided there was enough seed um, they were all germinated to make sure we could turn them into plants but not established and it's quite different germinating something on, a, on an agar um, plate um, to actually establishing something in soil that's 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 going to thrive, so, and that's that's where I think horticultural skills come in. Um, you know, in in terms of trees, we grow according to Plant Search, we grow about eighteen thousand different species of tree around around the world. Um, so about a third of the total. That is way way more than than the forestry sector, the you know the, the formal forestry sector. 
Uh, and um, you know, those skills, capturing those skills is, is, is critical. The protocols, um, another thing that we will add to plant search, I was just talking to Abby Mayer about it today, um, is a, a propagation um, protocol uh, um, add-on basically, so that we can start to, to build that up and make that available to people. Just like actually germination protocols are available through QSeed information database and other, other tools. Um, and I think it's essential that we start to share that knowledge with the rest of the world because it's not this is not something that we can tackle entirely on our own. Um, we can make a start, but um, you know we need broader society caring for and planting a much wider range of trees. We also need to re-educate foresters that there's 60,000 tree species out there, and that doesn't mean we have to plant eucalyptus and um, pinus patula or pinus radiata everywhere. I mean, you know, there's there's work to be done there. Absolutely. Um, but we, we can play our part uh, and, you know, we, we have a lot of, of, of relevant knowledge. Yeah. Now, that's uh, that's ring shrews here in New Zealand. We have a, a booming forestry industry, but it's all into Pinus radiata primarily. There are very, very, very we're talking probably 80% uh, of, uh, of all of our forestry is in Pinus radiata. And, and we know what can go wrong to the introduction of a um, of any type of uh, pest or disease which comes through would have a huge impact to a, to a very important uh, primary industry here, which is which is very important. So. So with the aims of our Trees for Our Future campaign, um, we're trying to amplify our collection. We're trying to engage and collaborate with as, uh, as many different organizations as possible. Um, how do you think our isolated uh, collection can make a meaningful impact for global tree conservation? Um, what, what do you feel is, the, is, is a good way forward for us to, to really start these, uh, these, these small steps into the right direction? I think partnership is key and, um, you know, working, working with partners around the world, making, um, you know, information about your collections available, that, that helps uh, enormously in sort of creating opportunities, I think, for a partnership, for projects and, and, and so on. Um, you know, one thing that we're not good at uh, in, in our sector, for example, is understanding or recording how our collections are used. Um, in fact, we've we've got um, Cambridge University Botanic Garden at the moment sort of pouring over about 17,000 requests for plant material that have come through the plant search um, um, sort of portal mechanism wow. to find out exactly what those are used for, because, you know, we're not great at following that up. Um, if you're if you're maintaining collections, it's expensive. Um, there needs to be application and you, you, you usually need to be able to make the case that, that there's a, a return on that, that investment. So I think getting involved in projects like that where you're supporting research, um, particularly, I mean, there are huge opportunities uh, at the moment, Martin. I, I think um, everybody wants to plant trees. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, you, you'll pick, pick this up. I mean, even over here, we've got the different political parties competing with each other as to how many trees they're going to plant. It's um, well, survive, though, is the key thing. I mean, they're there in 10, 15, 10, 100 years' time. That's the key principle of this, isn't it? Exactly. And um, at the moment, there's also a lot of very poor practice. Um, you know, there's, there's zillions of dollars going into this. And, you know, we've been involved to a degree with um, organizations like 1T.org, yep. which is the World Economic Forum Group. That's Amazon, it's Google, it's AstraZeneca, it's Shell. It's, you know, it's all these, these companies that want to offset their their carbon emissions, but they don't know what to plant where. Uh, and there's a lot of middlemen that are coming up and saying, oh, you know, we can plant these things for you really cheaply. Um, and, um, you know, then there's people on the ground who, who don't have enough funding or enough knowledge. I think there's a huge role for us um, and, and our community in supporting that. If we don't do it, then the consequences are, are likely to be appalling. Um, you know, we're looking at here uh, yet another human landscape intervention, this one for putting carbon in the ground, mm -hmm. that could further destroy biodiversity. So, I, you know, I, I feel we, we should be involved in this, um, as well as it being appropriate to our skills and, and knowledge. There's a, a moral imperative as well. And also, you know, it, it, it can bring in funding. And, um, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's what we, we aim for, which is to be relevant to society. Mm -hmm. There's never been a better time, uh, mm -hmm. I think, for tree organizations to show their relevance to society. Absolutely. And it's great because um, it's never, it's, uh, I, I, I genuinely am enthused and, and hopeful for the next generation, the amount of uh, younger people we see coming out here 
um, and just interesting, asking questions. It's 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 yeah. quite remarkable. It's a um, you know we we don't get many people through the gate here. Our isolation tends to we have to be a bit of a tree nerd to really want to come here because we are that isolated. But when people do come here, um, and when people do utilize this collection because it's it is open to be utilized, then you know, we just need to get those people through the gate and and. Um, uh, I'm sure people will come, you know, avid supporters once they get here. It's it's a case of that we we finding that with the younger generation is that um, they are genuinely concerned, and it's great to have that groundswell. And um, I'm, I'm generally enthused. I think it's great that the um, the bigger corporates are looking at um, at these programs. But again, it's doing the right thing at the right time for the right outcome, and not just um, seeing it as a way to, to to ditch some carbon, which is a which which is a bit of a will be a bit of an over exaggeration but it's follow through and that's one thing that we um uh, that, that we obviously like to hear about but obviously want to get involved with and, and we've reflected that slightly in the way that we're going to position ourselves with people who are a way to be able to to give to our organization or become a partner so we're going to be looking at options around where corporates can get involved it's um it's a state of the the nation and the world in many cases where people are there are opportunities and we have to maximize that and uh, as an organization that currently receives no direct government funding it's a uh, it's a perpetual struggle for, for funding and um uh, you know since 1975 when the board was was formed here uh, we were very lucky that um hb williams gifted uh, uh, an endowment fund um, for us to be able to survive. We still operate today at a financial deficit, but the, um, the fund then tops us up to break us even. If that wasn't there, this collection of trees could be very in a very different state. So, I mean, we we are we, we struggle to get enough funding. We and as a result of that, our collection is is kind of going backwards because we need to invest more to employ more skilled staff. We need climbing arborists. We need propagation specialists. We've got capital funding uh, that we need to make sure that our infrastructure is suitable here. So it's really keen to understand from your perspective at that global scale that the funding is coming through. So. Do you think that the at that global scale it, it's it's going to to continue? Do you think do you feel that you're getting more and more yeah. interest in, in what you're doing and how that could then filter through to, to the to the ex situ collections? Yeah, definitely. So um, we've also been kind of racking our brains about um, you know what our role is exactly within this this kind of value chain, and um, we've um, we'll be launching at COP26 in Glasgow. Um, a global biodiversity standard. Um, uh, it's essentially a site-based certification scheme. Um, we, we'll be announcing the development of it and uh, over the next couple of years, um, developing the methodology with partners. And basically what that is, is two things. The first thing is it's a site-based assessment looking at impacts on biodiversity. Uh, and those site-based assessments will be carried out by our local partners, the likes of, of you guys, and others who know their own biodiversity, they know their own tree diversity and so on, and the context, the social economic context. There'll be, um, it'll be a global standard in terms of the fact that it's, um, it's a voluntary standard, but it will be sort of comparable across the, the, the globe. Um, and then the second element to it is really a mentoring opportunity because you know, if you're carrying out a site assessment, um, let's say Shell or whoever put a whole bunch of trees in, I'm hoping that they're not Pinus radiata. If they are Pinus radiata, then you're in a position to say to them, well, actually guys, you know, you could do a little better. There's an opportunity here to incorporate um, some native species with good knock-ons for biodiversity, give you more resilience and, and so on. And then you're in the perfect position to help them to do that um, because you have the knowledge, you can help with material, you can help with setting up nurseries and so on. And, you know, one of the, one of the issues for our community is we have all this knowledge, we have all of this data. We are never, almost never, involved in decision-making around uh, large-scale land use change. Um, we need a mechanism whereby we're using our, you know, the, the skills we have around botanical survey and inventory, nobody can argue that, you know, that, that um, that's, you know, we have the best data, we have the best expertise, we have people who know one tree from another, basically. Um, we have people who can name all of those 60,000 tree species. So, um, it, it, you know, that's that's absolutely key. And, and that's the assessment element. It's that certification element. Um, we don't have all of the answers for restoration. You know, we're, we're learning um, as a society. We largely might manage our collections in, in, you know, in our gardens, but we're getting better and better at it. 
And provided that we partner with others, I think we have the opportunity to scale up that knowledge and to create opportunities, not just in species recovery, but also in livelihoods in climate change adaptation, you know, and, and those other areas. So we're really excited about it. We see that as a vehicle for engaging our community. And by that, we mean you, yeah. um, you know, partners who are on the ground, understand their local biodiversity and the best people to do it. And it is the opposite model from the current carbon certification where they fly in consultants, it's top down, um, you know, who, who, who will come in and hugely expensive, I have to say. Um, you know, this is something that would be affordable, accessible to grassroots organizations, not just to palm oil companies. You know, it needs to be something that works for everybody. Yeah. Um, and we can do that because, you know, we have these skills, we're on the ground already. Um, and, you know, and it will also pay for itself. That's the, the business model needs to needs to make sure that you are, um, you know, being remunerated for that with perhaps a little bit on top that you can put put back into plant yeah. conservation. Yeah, I think that's um, such a, it seems strange that we've been away from that conversation for so long, but I think that, you know, the strides that BGCI and others obviously uh, are doing, it, it's it's putting that in the right space, you know, the, the communications which need to come out are coming out now, in, in my opinion, and I think they're coming out at a level which is, which is clear, concise and digestible. I think one of the things that we have done in the past is probably be a little bit too technical and not really understand a wider audience. Uh, and it's great that we can have conversations like this and uh, hopefully spread the word a little bit um, and, uh, and, make, and make those impacts because, you know, that it sounds, uh, sounds very basic, but without trees, there's a lot of issues uh, that, uh, that we're facing. And it, in the very simplest form, we've got to be, we've got to have a plan and that plan needs to be uh, connected and it needs to be integrated and it needs to actually work. And there's so many times when you see, um, you know, even in an urban context, you know, you see street tree planting going on and it's just not gonna work. It's just not had any thought process to it. Um, or you've had a, you know, a, a whole scale major infrastructure project and they've, you know, you know, they've done some ecological restoration in a space, but is it really, you know, it's time for those actions to, to make sure they deliver as much impact as they can. And so that's one thing that's really good to see. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll get better at it. Um, as an industry, we, we need to yep. get better at it. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, as I said before, I'm really hopeful. I think the next generation will, will lead us forward. We've, there's a lot of space, there's a lot of opportunity in this, uh, in this space. Uh, and we just got to make sure that we do it the best as we can and, and adapt um, when we need to. So, so yeah, I'm really confused. Yeah, and I, I mean, there's one other thing I'd say, and that is that we need to go out and meet that next generation uh, rather than wait for them to come to us. Um, you know, that's that's that again is, is is part of our thinking with this is that if we can work with grassroots organisations with communities and help them to do something a bit better for biodiversity, then uh, you know that's going to be a, a virtuous circle, and um, you know we it's something that that, that we should be doing, and it, it will also uh, you know, be, be the best way to use use the knowledge and skills that we have within this sector. So yeah, I, I'm optimistic. And, um, you know, just one last word on, on how we continue that, you know, the reason that we, we published State of the World's Trees was because we could not get IUCN to, um, in any of their press releases to mention trees. Wow. Um, it was it was elephants, it was whales, it was tuna last time. And they said, well, nobody's interested in trees. Wow. Actually, actually, you know, that State of the World's Trees report, um, so far we're over 1,500 um, newspaper articles, 36 yeah. different languages, 63 countries. It was picked up everywhere uh, around the world. People love trees. Yeah. Um, and so, so we, we, we sent all the statistics to IUCN and said, people do love trees. And if you want publicity, then for heaven's sake, include trees in some of your press releases because yeah um you know they they are they are beloved yeah they are they certainly are and uh yeah i mean the uh the impact of those reports i i, I as soon as i was i was reading it i was like this is this is a great pathway to great to some great results and i know that there's going to be some more um some more some more reports coming out on utilizing that data and putting it into action so um look, the bgci uh, putting out some fantastic stuff and uh you know, you, everybody should be, you know, directed to, to, their, to their website uh, and they should be directed. We'll put some links through into the, into the description to this below and we'll, we'll make sure that we flush it up at the end of on our launch evening. 
Um, and we'll make even the things like the LinkedIn page is just brilliant. It's it's frequent. There's good tangible information that's that's really readily available, and it's great to be able to have that source for which is so valuable to us because you know we we can we can piggyback off off, off your information. We did a re, we we did some um, analysis on those critical those threatened tree species throughout the different realms of the world, and uh, and, and we put up our stats uh, onto onto our, onto our LinkedIn page. Just that connection of how. This, this, our small collection in in uh, in Natapa, in a small little diverse community in, uh, um, in, in on the corner at the end of the world, really is is still it's that connection. It's it's where um, you know we we have such important places to play, and um, uh, and it's great that we can we can tap into that. So it's it's gratefully um, you know appreciated, and uh, and and the impact that it's going to have is going to be huge. So look, Paul, I've taken up far too much of your time. I realize it's uh, your evening and you'll probably want to get back to your home life. So I'd just like to thank you on behalf of the board and everybody here at Eastwood Hill. Thank you very much for getting involved. And um, uh, yeah, if, uh, if, if we can help in any way, please just reach out. Brilliant, thanks. Thanks Martin, appreciate it. Um, and good luck with your campaign. Likewise, if there's anything we can do to help raise the profile of that, we're very happy to do so. Great stuff. Thanks Great very stuff. much, Paul.